In the last few videos, we've tried to use mathematical optimization to identify Nash equilibria, and we've only had success in limited settings like two-player zero-sum games. But since we've also encountered a number of solution concepts other than Nash equilibrium, it's worth considering whether any of them are easier to compute. And in the case of correlated equilibria, we're in luck. So in this video, I want to demonstrate how we can use linear programming to find either a correlated or a coarse-correlated equilibrium. Both of these solution concepts specify a probability distribution over a game's outcomes, and then impose constraints on that distribution based on when the players are best responding and what information they have. So for both of our linear programs, we'll have a variable representing the probability of each outcome in the game. And like usual, if we are representing a probability distribution, we will constrain the variables to have a value between 0 and 1, and that all of the probabilities sum up to 1. But from here, these two linear programming approaches diverge, and in the case of correlated equilibrium, we know that whenever the distribution tells a player to use a particular action, it must be a best response for them to do so. And we can express that in terms of linear program constraints, where we'll have constraints for each combination of a player, one of their actions, and one of their possible deviations away from that action, and the constraint will enforce that the expected utility of playing the action you were told is at least as good as the expected utility of playing the action you might deviate to. So, for this example game, if we have some probability distribution over the outcomes, that distribution might tell player 1 to play T, or it might tell them to play B. If it tells them to play T, then player 1 will update their beliefs, ruling out the possibility of any of the outcomes where they don't play T, and renormalizing the probabilities on all of the outcomes where they do play T. So then, for this distribution to be a correlated equilibrium, it must be the case that after this belief update, when player 1 compares the expected utility of playing T against the distribution they expect from the opponents, that's at least as good as the expected utility for playing B against that same distribution. After player 1's belief update when they're told to play T, they think the probability that player 2 will choose L is this probability over the sum of these two probabilities, and the probability that player 2 will play R is this probability over the sum. And so we can use those conditional probabilities to write down a constraint which says that the utility of T must be at least the utility of B. Player 1's expected utility for playing T under the beliefs when they're told to play T is 3 times the probability that the opponent plays L, plus 1 times the probability that the opponent plays R, and for the distribution to be a correlated equilibrium, that should be greater than or equal to the expected utility for playing B under those same beliefs. So, this constraint, and several more like it, would express the requirements that all of the players are best responding for each of the actions they might be told to play. But unfortunately, this constraint is not linear, since we are dividing by some of our linear program variables. But luckily, since we are dividing every single term by the same thing, we can simply cancel them all out, 
And as long as the denominator is always positive, then multiplying through by that denominator won't change the inequality. And that gives us a much simpler constraint that is in fact linear. And the cancellation we've done is fine as long as both of these probabilities are positive, and we know they can never be negative, but it is possible that they're both zero. And so we should think about what would this constraint mean in the case where both of these probabilities were zero. Well, that would correspond to the case where player one is never told to play t in the correlated equilibrium distribution. And in the case where both of the probabilities are zero, this constraint would simplify to zero is greater than or equal to zero, which is true. So as long as the probability of being told to play t is non-zero, this constraint corresponds to what we wanted from the correlated equilibrium definition. And if both of these probabilities are zero, then this constraint doesn't get in the way. And so we can proceed to add similar constraints for each of the other cases. If we think about what else could player one deviate to when they're told to play T, if player one had additional actions, we would have more constraints for the case where they're told to play T. But since there are only two actions, we only needed one constraint that playing T is better than playing B. And so we can move on to the next of player one's actions and write a constraint that when they are told to play B, that's better than deviating. When player one is told to play B, they update their beliefs to just the probabilities in the bottom row. And so our expected utility expressions for playing B or for deviating will be in terms of those probabilities, which correspond to the unnormalized probabilities that the opponent will play left or right. And in the case where they play what they're told, they'll get a utility of two or seven. Whereas if they deviate, they'll get a utility of three or one. And for it to be a correlated equilibrium, we want following what you were told to be at least as good. So we will constrain that the expected utility of B is greater than or equal to that of T. Likewise, for player two, we will have a constraint for when they are told to play left and they narrow the distribution down to just these two outcomes, or when they're told to play right and they narrow the distribution down to the ones in that column. And in each case, we'll compare the expected utility when they play what they're told to the expected utility if they instead deviate to their other action. If player two is told to play L, then the expected utility for playing L should be at least the expected utility for playing R. And if they're told to play R, then the expected utility for playing R should be at least the expected utility for playing L. And so if the linear program solver can find a distribution over the outcomes with valid probabilities that meets all of these constraints, then we know that under that distribution, whenever a player is told to play a particular action, playing that action is better than any of the available deviations. And so that distribution must be a correlated equilibrium. And if we think for a moment about the geometry of these variables and constraints, since our linear program has a variable for each of the four outcomes in this game, a correlated equilibrium is some point in four-dimensional space, but since those points are probability distributions where all of the coordinates are between 0 and 1 and add up to 1, we know that that four-dimensional point lives within a three-dimensional simplex. So all of the possible 
probability distributions over four outcomes correspond to some point in this tetrahedron. And when we write down these constraints that enforce the correlated equilibrium conditions, that will reduce what portion of this simplex could be a correlated equilibrium. So geometrically, we can think of each constraint as slicing off some region of the simplex and saying, on one side of a hyperplane, those are not correlated equilibria, but on the side where this linear inequality is satisfied, those could potentially be correlated equilibria. And whatever region of the simplex is left, after the slices corresponding to all of the constraints have been applied, will contain all of the distributions that are correlated equilibria of this game. For a coarse correlated equilibrium, we have slightly different conditions because the players are considering deviating before they have found out which action they are assigned. And so each of the constraints of this linear program will be enforcing that for some player and for one of that player's actions, it is not a beneficial deviation to switch to that action over participating in the distribution. So we'll have a constraint for each player and each of their actions. But since all of those constraints involve the player's expected utility of the overall distribution, saying that the distribution is at least as good as the deviation, we can simplify things a bit by having an equation for the expected utility of participating in the distribution, which we can then use in our various constraints. For player one, the utility of participating is three times the probability of the top left outcome, plus one times the probability of the top right outcome, plus two times this probability, plus seven times this probability. And player 2's expected utility is calculated using the same probabilities of each outcome, but taking player 2's utilities from the payoff matrix. And now, for the distribution to be a coarse correlated equilibrium, we need that the participation utility for player 1 is at least as good as deviating to t, and that it's at least as good as deviating to b. And likewise for player 2, participating in the distribution has to be at least as good as deviating to either L or R. If player 1 is thinking about deviating in a coarse correlated equilibrium setting, they are considering that before they are told which action they will play. So to get the probability of the opponent outcomes, they need to sum up over all of their actions the probability where the opponents are all playing the same thing. So player one thinks of the opponent as choosing left with the sum of these two probabilities and right with the sum of these two probabilities. So if player one is considering a deviation to t, then they'll get a payoff of three with this probability and a payoff of 1 with this probability. But if they're considering a deviation to b, then they'll get a payoff of 2 or 7 with those same probabilities. Likewise, for player 2, we want to constrain that participating is at least as good as each possible deviation. So player 2 will add up these variables to get player 1's probability of t, and these two variables to get player 1's probability of b. 
And if they're considering deviating to L, then they'll get a utility of 4 or 6. And for R, with the same probabilities, they would get either 8 or 5. So all of the constraints we have expressed here are linear because on both sides of the inequality, we can simplify down to just a sum of constant times variable. And since these constraints express the condition that no one wants to deviate before being told their action, if we can find some distribution that has valid probabilities and meets all of these constraints, then it must be a coarse-correlated equilibrium. Of note, in both of these linear programs, we have not specified an objective. All we need in order to find either a coarse-correlated or a correlated equilibrium is to find some point that satisfies all of the corresponding inequalities. But when we run a linear programming solver, we can generally, at no extra computational cost, provide an objective function of something for it to maximize or minimize. So if we are using linear programming to give us some sort of correlated equilibrium, we will often specify some objective function to give us the best correlated equilibrium according to some criterion. And so I encourage you to look back at the criteria we used to aggregate preferences over multiple decision makers and think about which of those could be expressed as a linear function that we could maximize as a part of our linear programs.